Okay, so uh, talking about some of the events that have been happening up and down the country uh, as a result of the catalyst of the uh, Southport uh, massacre or killing of three innocent children and uh, the wounding of another nine. So, uh, yeah, Napoleon once said that a crowd, so an army is a crowd that obeys orders. Repeat, an army is a crowd that obeys orders. Uh, by that, it means that you can get 100 people and you can tell them to get fed in and they will form up in their ranks. You can tell them the left turn and at that moment in time, two seconds after, everyone would turn to the left. If you said about turn, everyone would have turned to the right. If you say would advance, everyone uh, right turn again, everyone would turn to the front. If you said left turn by the centre, quick march, they would all march in a certain direction. If you said by the double, double mark, they would all be running in that direction. If you shouted a bout turn, they would all do an about turn and run in the opposite direction. If you shouted out halt, they would all stop at the same time. Now, a lot of times when you see drill done, people take the fun. That's one of the biggest ridicules which the British Army gets when they're teaching uh, recruits how to do drill. And yet, that is one of the most effective things which any army can do. Because an army is a crowd that obeys orders. When you have a drum in the mix and trumpets, yeah, you get even better coordination. What that does is that you can leverage the power of 100 men, women, 100 persons, if you like, vis-a-vis -vis a crowd. So you can have 100 disciplined people who can obey orders be a crowd or a mob of a thousand, and that hundred can overwhelm that thousand. Now, we've seen this in Downing Street, uh, where the police kettled in the protesters and then picked them off one by one on trumped up charges. And the net effect was that they could announce that they made a hundred arrests for this demonstration against the murder of uh, an in innocent children and also you know, the badly wounding of around nine others. Yeah. So in terms of the media war, the police sort of won that hands down. Now, in Southport, I understand that the riots took off, not just out of the blue, but apparently there was an Asian chap who was caught carrying a machete heading towards the vigil. And when he was, when he was discovered... Apparently, he, made, he legged it towards the mosque. And when he was in the mosque, that is where the focus was. Now, two things here. I don't know if that individual was arrested. And if the individual was arrested, the police aren't saying much about it. But number two, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, you know, so you've got that arrest. Um you know, we don't know what their, their intention or what his intentions were, but obviously that's sparking it up. Now, what is interesting is that the media then immediately go into the far-right label. The far-right label is a means of suppression. Yeah, If we rewind back about 20 years, they would be calling the far-right chaps. Yeah? Because this is another layer onto the mix of what has been going on in regards to gaslighting the British population, in regards to the problems what we've got. Yeah, uh, by calling people far right, you distance yourself, you su you suppress it, and people who would totally understand uh, about the dissent are sort of like corralled into saying nothing, corralled into clapping their hands, saying you know don't look back in anger corralled in giving teddy bears at the vigils, anything but actual vocal uh, condemnation of what's been going on. You notice also that when uh, uh, local people uh, do protest and, and are, okay, even if they're rioting, they are called far right. Yeah, when 
there was writing at the Harefields or there was demonstration at the police station where these uh, Asian people had assaulted the police officers and uh, sort of broke their noses, yeah? They weren't called exam uh, Islamic extremists. That label doesn't, they don't get that label. They're not, they're not called far left. What they are called are community. They're called a community, yeah? Um, it's concerning. I mean, the uh, attacker in uh, Southport, um, apparently, ironically, will come from Urand uh, Rwandan heritage. Now, that's a politically charged sort of name of a country in our current environment at the moment, because it represents the £700 million which was wasted on the conservative policy of trying to bring refugees to Uranda. So the, ir the irony of some random person from Rwanda sort of driving down by Uber, covering their face to carry out these attacks. They're not to be called terrorist attacks, just like the, the stabbing of the officer uh, last week is not to be called a terrorist attack. It's to do with mental health. You know, I think it's probably just around, it's around 200 people in the last 20 years have been killed by uh, isolated madmen from a particular demographic religion, okay? And for the record, that is more than uh, soldiers who were killed in Iraq, in both Iraq wars. More British civilians have been killed by that particular demographic than soldiers in the Iraq war. Fact. Fact. So when we're talking about a war, in all honesty, that war is here. It's on the ground now. It's happening within our cities. It's a cultural war. But laid over the top of it is a class war or the class stirrings, one of the, the, the bogus situations of, of Britain. You know, Labour is filled with uh, in, intelligentsia, if you like, in their po politics, who are disenfranchised from their grassroots working class people. There is a despising of the working class. And because of that, you have situations where, like Nigel Farage, finds it difficult to find a bridge between the uh, interest group, grassroots interest group of, say, the Tom and Robinson and the, uh, the patriotism, yeah, vis-a-vis -vis his political ambitions of galvanising dissatisfied uh, population on immigration. I mean, technically speaking, these two uh, organisations should be, uh, they're running in parallel, they, they should be actually uniting. But what's preventing that uniting is the perception, mainly painted by the mainstream media, of working class people and the despisement of working class people by the establishment. That's what it's about. That is what it's about, in my view. In my view, that's what, that is the real issue. So Nigel Farage wants to keep uh, true British patriots at arm's length because they're working class and they have uh, working class concerns. But at the same time, he wants the leverage of that uh, electoral uh, support for his own political ambitions. And at the same time, the uh, grass movements, call it enough is enough, or British Patriot Party, <laughs> that would be a good moment, British Patriot Party, everyone's all included, very inclusive. You just need to believe in Britain and British values. So unfortunately, that is a grassroots organisation with zero lobbying power. It, it cannot lobby the government there, was a, there are no sort of uh, avenues upon which they can lobby so the only thing what they can do is to protest on the street they're not seeing any particular ministers to me the uh the game plan needs to be to advocate and to push for um proportional representation it's only when you get proportional representation do things become alive things become tangible change is tangible that is where you break up, you break up the uni party situation. See, the uni party and establishment wants to break up the House of Lords so they get more power. 
more power. They have less votes overall from the people, but they can obtain more power by watering down the House of Lords. I'm against the watering down of the House of Lords, myself personally. Yeah, I believe there should be proportional representation so that all votes get a hearing. House of Lords are to act as a break, a break stop for outrageous ideas from uh, rogue executive governments. So those are my thoughts and feelings, really. Uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, over and out. <laughs>